As everybody's filtering back in, I, I just do want to say that the one, the real heart of us all wanting to gather together is uh, it's a lot of philosophical foundations because those things are incredibly important for us as a team. But it's also these moments of getting to connect and getting to meet people across our network. Uh, it matters a lot that we know it's not just each of us at our individual campuses, but we are part of a whole and we're all moving in the same direction together. Well, uh, as Winston mentioned, my name is Josh Herring and uh, today I will be uh, speaking to the concept of the good. Uh, this is my 10th year working for Thales Academy. Uh, I've played a, a variety of different roles along the way. I've been a humanities instructor and a dean of uh, students, most recently an assistant administrator, and now I get to serve as dean of classical education for Thales Academy Apex. Uh, I am really excited to get to speak to you today. I love the school. I love our mission. Uh, we do a lot as a school. Uh, one of my favorite parts <clears throat> is that we are specifically trying to take what has formerly been available only to the economic elites in this country and make that available to the average American family. Uh, that's an incredible thing that we get to be a part of. At the same time, we're specifically trying to take knowledge, skills, and virtue and, sh and pour those into the next generation so that we help them in the process of transforming from children into adults. We don't do that alone. We do that in partnership with families, uh, with, with our surrounding communities. Uh, it's a great thing that we get to do. I hope today you walk away reminded uh, that teaching is indeed a noble calling. There's a lot of uh, uh, nitty gritty things that we're gonna get into over the rest of this week, uh, but I hope today you walk away just refreshed knowing that you are about something that is vitally, vitally important. Well, I'm tasked today <coughs> with trying to define something that just might be impossible to define. Uh, if you were to take an average dictionary and look for the term the good, uh, you would find somewhere between 15 and 20 different definitions based on the dictionary you were looking at. Now we use the term good to cover a lot of different grounds. Hey, how was the movie? It was good. Oh, is that, is that ice cream any good? Yeah, man, it's real good. You should get some of that ice cream. Oh, how's the candidate for that office this year? Oh, he's a good guy. You should vote for him. Now, all three of those are wildly different understandings of the term good, and there, there's a lot more that we could go into. Um, today, I want to look at the, the sense of goodness that is implied in our mission statement. Uh, when we look at the idea that we as a faculty exist to cultivate excellent people through the pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness, well, what kind of goodness are we talking about? Well, today, I want to look, we're going to look at sense of goodness in terms of the philosophical view of the term the good. And I want to look at that in kind of three main areas. We're going to look at the good as a universal principle. We're going to look at the good as something that needs to be particularly applied. And we're also going to look then at the moral dimension of the good. And to do that, we're going to take a look at, from, we're going to take insights from three major philosophers across the tradition. And I hope that by the time I'm done, you have a working picture of what does this mean for you as a teacher in your classroom? How does this philosophical con uh, concept of the good have immense relevance for everything that you do uh, each day? So <clears throat> with that, uh, we'll begin where most philosophy begins, with the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. Now, Plato is preeminently the philosopher of the universals. Plato believed in ideas. He believed that ideas transcended the physical. They don't change. They aren't really particular. They are, they are higher than that. So when Plato is thinking about the good, he put it in with the other two transcendentals we're discussing today, the three highest ideas, the good, the true, the beautiful. Those three ideas, he argued, exist above everything. And they aren't physical, they're not, you can't go find them somewhere. Instead, they exist in the world of ideas, the world of the forms. You and I can access them in some way because of the spirit. We get beyond the physical into the, into the world of the ideas. Now, Plato argued that everything that exists is somehow related towards these highest ideas. Everything that exists is trying in some way to be good. But what on earth does that mean? Maybe an example would help. That's, the sec that's really the third image on this slide uh, with the, the, the two trees. Uh, I think this is something we as teachers can resonate with, hopefully. Uh, by a quick show of hands, has anybody ever done a rubric assignment? You've given an assignment, you scored it by a rubric, yep. Uh, if your hand is down, your administrator is probably gonna tell you you need to use, start using rubrics. It's a, it's a common theme. Now, what Plato is talking about with this idea of the good is that there is an idea and we measure goodness based on how well the thing itself lines up with the idea. That's exactly what we do every time we have a rubric. In some alternate universe where I'm teaching people how to draw trees, 
Uh, if I were to then collect a set of drawings and measure the drawings based on the criteria laid out in my rubric, I thought to myself, what makes for a good tree? I'm looking for clear lines. I'm looking to be able to tell that it is in fact a tree. Uh, maybe I've asked for proportionality in the drawing and those become my criteria. And then I score whether, I decide whether it's a good drawing based on whether it actually looks like a tree. Well, if I look at it and I can see those things, I say, this is a good drawing. If I look at those elements and say, oh, this is terrible, this is not a good drawing. Well, in that case, I've looked at this physical thing and measured whether it lines up with the idea. I've taken a particular artifact and said, this does or does not line up with the universal. Now that's what Plato's talking about when he talks about the good. For Plato, the good is a transcendent universal principle that everything is trying to be. Everything is trying to aspire to the good. Now what does that have to do with our students? Well, in that sense, uh, we really need to also take a look then at the main ideas from Greek philosopher Aristotle. So, with that, we'll move on to, the, to Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle was the preeminent philosopher of the next generation, and he disagreed with Plato profoundly. Aristotle believed that those universal ideas, they don't exist. Plato is wrong about those. Instead, Aristotle said, well, the good is not actually out there somewhere. Instead, the good can be found inside each thing. <clears throat> if Plato is the philosopher of the universals, Aristotle is the philosopher of the particulars. For Aristotle, it is all about figuring out what is the actual nature and essence of each thing. And when we look at whether a thing achieves its purpose, whether it fulfills its essence, then we say that it's good. Now, to do that then, uh, that requires us to understand what the essence of something is, what makes it itself and not something else. Another example. Uh, perhaps I wake up one morning to drive to school and my car simply doesn't work. It sort of cranks, but it doesn't actually start and I can't leave the driveway. My car is less than excellent. It does not fulfill its essence. I can't use it to get to work. It doesn't serve the purpose. Well, in that moment, what I'm going to do is either try and fix it, or more likely, I'm going to get it towed to a mechanic and get the mechanic to fix it. Because the mechanic has the precise knowledge of all the different parts. The mechanic knows how all the parts are supposed to work together. The mechanic knows what exactly the essence of each component of the engine is for, and how they work together to achieve the overall purpose. If I had the mechanic's knowledge, then perhaps I'd be able to do the same thing. Since I don't, I'm stuck until the mechanic can make my car work. Now for Aristotle, the good is not some grand universal truth that we need to aspire to. Instead, the good is much more focused. Uh, what we're looking at then as teachers is to try and figure out a couple different elements then of the good. I think the first of those elements is that we have to ask ourselves, well, what, what kind of thing are our students? Uh, our students are all human beings. There are certain elements that are common across the board. We know that our students are growing from childhood into adulthood. We know that our students are moving from ignorance towards knowledge. In that sense, we know certain things are true about them and certain things are good for them, even if they don't like it. Uh, we, it's our job at times to know, okay, you are a student at this stage of your life, these things are good, and I'm gonna push you towards those things. So I think Aristotle reminds us that our first task as teachers is to be students of human nature. We need to know what is true of all our students. But secondly, as that preeminent philosopher of particulars, Aristotle pushes us to be, con to be concerned about each individual student as a unique person. All of our students come to our classrooms with concerns, with family dynamics in their background, uh, with a lot of stuff going on. Maybe there is a friend group that just fractured. Maybe there is a long-term six-week relationship that just ended. And all of a sudden, that crying child is in your classroom and you have to figure out, what do I do? Now, in that kind of moment, that, that really is where you as a teacher are pressed to figure out, what is the good for this student? So I think if we have that question in our minds, it pushes us to consider not just the grand sense in which are, what are, in what sense are all things good, but also in what sense is, what is the good for this particular student? How do I help this student achieve that good? Now, this also means that we as teachers need to be particularly attuned to the way this operates in our classrooms. Uh, I think there are moments for all of us where we as teachers see places where we can push students to consider these questions. 
what is the good and how do we, le- how do we live in light of that answer? Now again, that's gonna be different for, for each age and for each content area. For a lot of humanities classes, that's gonna be in Socratic seminars where you frame questions that encourage and shape conversations. Uh, for other classes, it may, inc- it may sometimes be that a student has in fact uttered a clearly wrong answer. And in that moment, uh, you have a, you have a, your role shifts as a teacher, where instead of suddenly thinking, how do I create an open space where students feel comfortable venturing whatever they think, to uphold the good in that moment means to articulate to the student politely, but clearly, that's wrong. If a student were to literally confidently utter in a math classroom, two plus two equals five, That's not true, it's not good if students think that that is the case. That's a misunderstanding of reality. And in that moment, it's the teacher's task to uphold what is true and to present that as good and to call the students to understand that in particular. So, just to briefly summarize where we're at so far, (coughs) Plato pushes us to consider the good in a universal sense, that all things are trying to exemplify goodness in a certain way. Now, at the same time, Aristotle reminds us that the good is particular. So we don't want to leave, we don't want to live on either of these two levels. Instead, we want to figure out how do both of those help us. In what places is it helpful to think about the good as a universal, that is always the case, but also how does that help us with knowing who people are and knowing who our students are? So, I want to bring in one final philosopher before we kind of wrap up for today, uh, and that philosopher is Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas was a medieval uh, theologian who wrote one of the seminal works of philosophy called the Summa Theologica. And in the Summa, Aquinas considered, he adds really two other elements to our consideration of the good today. He does that in his famous five arguments for the existence of God. Uh, The first of those elements is really thinking about how the good helps us to think about things in a hierarchy. Uh, Now, Aquinas argued that if you have two things that are in the same category, one of them is going to be better than the other. This too, I think all of us recognize as teachers, as I suspect if I were to poll the audience, we all have a favorite office supply. When that, that option to order your supplies for the year goes out, you have one thing you wanna make sure that you get. For me, it's Uniball pens. Uniball pens are intrinsically better than the cheap beak pens I get all the time. Now, my problem is that I tend to lose these pens. I leave them behind, I can't find them, they're gone. So I don't order very many of them. I usually get the really cheap pens. What does that have to do with the good? Well, Aquinas argues that the thing that all men know, he says all men know that the best in existence tells us what, how everything else is related to it. So I would say the best pen is a uniball pen. I can rank what is superior or inferior based on that uniball pen. This is a cheaper pen, the ink isn't very good, it blots, it sticks, I have to rub it a lot to get the ink flowing. It's not that great. This is far better. Now for Aquinas, the good is what tells us what's the top of a category. Well, in this case, the category is all existent things. That all things are related to that greatest good, which brings us into his second sense of the good, and that's the moral sensibility. For Aquinas, he says the thing that is truly that greatest existent thing, the greatest possible mode of being, is God himself. When we define something as good, what we are saying in that moment is that this resembles the greatest mode of existence. Now this brings us back to that classic Greek idea of the good life. That there are, Winston was kind of getting at, I think a few minutes ago, when he showed us a comparison between different kinds of ambitions. Hopefully we're all in agreement that a, a senior who says my chief ambition is to be a top blogger has misunderstood what the purpose of his or her life really is. Uh, there's something greater to aspire to. Uh, That's not the heart of the good life. Aquinas would argue that when we are looking at the good, we actually are affirming things for students. When we pronounce things to be good, we're asserting that they truly are actually morally good because they resemble that greatest possible mode of existence. So to bring this down to kind of three main pieces for today, Uh, The good then is universal. There is a sense in which we can say everything is attempting to be good, but the good can also be considered in terms of a particular uh, goodness that applies to a particular kind of thing. But there is also a comparison of things within a category where we're comparing some things are more good than others, but there's also this moral dimension. Now, I do want to also, I don't want to ignore the fact that this moral dimension of goodness is tricky for us as a school. 
Uh, we are not a Christian classical school. There are certain tools we do not have access to. We can't point necessarily to chapter and verse. We don't have a doctrinal statement or a, a creed that we can then point to. Uh, we, we can't do that. We don't have those tools. What we do have, though, are 6,000 years of recorded human history that agree on a series of habits that lead students towards a good life. Uh, we, and those habits we call virtues. And it's part of affirming this concept of goodness that we want to push our students towards understanding the virtues and eventually choosing those virtues for themselves. We want students to value integrity. We want them to look for people who will lead them as human beings of integrity rather than failing in integrity. Uh, we want students to work hard. We want them to value working hard. Uh, we want students to work together. We think teamwork is an important dynamic. We also want students to be self-reliant, to govern their own desires and see what it takes to get where they want to go. A lot of these virtues are codified in our Thales outcomes, but those themselves <coughs> are pointing towards an overall vision that we do want to encourage our students to live virtuous lives. So when we're considering the good, it, the idea of goodness asks us to consider what are we wanting to see in our students? And that takes us back to our mission statement. We are seeking to cultivate excellent people through the pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness. I wanna focus on that verb cultivating for just a moment. Uh, 10 years ago, when I, uh, the administrator who hired me told me that she was in the education game to make excellent people. That verb make is kind of tricky because we don't actually make our students. That's not really what's happening. We don't make them become better. Instead, I think cultivating gives us better imagery. Cultivating brings in the idea of farming. Just as a farmer cultivates the land, he weeds the field, he waters the ground, and eventually looks for the shoots to grow, that's exactly what we do in our classrooms. We prepare for teaching, we prepare the space, we invite students to learn, and we try to fence away as many distractions as possible, and then we look for the harvest. Now, unfortunately, it's part of teaching that we don't always get to see the harvest, but we know that the harvest is there, and it, the, everything that our students learn from us eventually bears fruit. It may take years, but it does eventually bear fruit. They become these people who live better lives because they've gone through our classrooms. So teaching is this craft of helping our students grow from children into adults. And in doing that, we wanna invite them into the journey of pursuing truth, beauty, and goodness.